I'm Daphne O'Neill here in San Francisco at Cartoon Art Museum, an amazing establishment featuring the art and history of comics and cartoons through the ages. We're going to step right in and find out what's going on at the museum right now and what the museum has been about throughout its history. So let's go. The museum is in its 29th year of uh, exhibiting cartoon art. We actually started in 1984. It was a group of collectors and they wanted to find a place where they could show the original art that they collected. And so they actually started putting together exhibitions and traveling them in places around the Bay Area. And then in 1987, uh, they got an endowment from Charles Schultz, who is the Peanuts creator, and they were able to get our first space. Cartoon Art Museum is not just for comic book enthusiasts. There's really something for everyone here. Cartoon art, uh, for us, you know, it's drawings with or without words that tell you a story or give you an opinion. That's comic book, comic strip, editorial cartoons, uh, animation, um, magazine and even children's book illustration. We've done even a couple of webcomic exhibits, so you know we like to be inclusive. Our, for us, it's all arts. Um, we're just a small museum in a big city, uh, but we're one of the only museums in the United States that is dedicated to all forms of cartoon art. I understand you have classes and workshops. Oh, absolutely. We do a number of programs. We have artist lectures. We have workshops for kids. Uh, we do a regular Saturday class uh, once a month for children and we do other classes during the summer and we've been doing more and more fun programming for people so not just children we have our third Thursday event where we're sort of open after hours give people a chance to come by after work and relax and and see some artwork and maybe have a drink. So why is it important to have an establishment like Cartoon Art Museum? As one of the only cartoon art museums in the country, you know, we're kind of the one place to go and see the original art. This is a very uh, vibrant, active art form. It's everywhere, but it's still not fully appreciated. Pe people enjoy comics and cartoons on a daily basis, whether it's in the newspaper or on television or reading a children's book. Uh, but they don't often stop to think about the people behind the work or the people creating the artwork. Uh, the talent and the creativity that's involved and you know we, we, we really like people to stop and take a moment and think about uh, the art and the artistry and the artist. I understand you have a permanent collection in addition to exhibitions that come and go. Yes, so the, uh, the museum was founded in 1984 by a man named Malcolm White. This, this was all his vision way back when. He formed a board of directors, he formed an advisory board of local cartoonists and cartoon art fans and brought the museum together. They had a pretty aggressive collections policy at the very beginning. They had a letter writing campaign, they made phone calls, uh, so they wanted to build the core of the permanent collection. Uh, one of the key players in that was Charles Schultz, who donated a lot of artwork to the museum and had enough clout that it was, it was pretty easy to talk other artists into donating artwork at the time. The collection's grown from there, it's over 7,000 pieces, and that includes uh, etchings going back to the 1600s and 1700s all the way through uh, very recent works from political cartoonists and web cartoonists and animators and animation studios and comic book artists and uh, the collection's always growing. We, we um, want to make sure that this material is around for generations to come. A person who may not be a total comic enthusiast can still get something out of a visit to this museum. Absolutely. A lot of people, it's more of a trip down memory lane, sort of nostalgia. They see something that they remember from their childhood. They had forgotten about how much they enjoyed the comics, or they'll go through. We do have a room that goes through the history of, a brief history of cartoons. Sort of, there's a little something for everybody, and even if you're not an artist, you get to see these originals, and you're just like, oh, you see a Peanuts original, and I mean, who, who doesn't like Peanuts? Um, it's just really fun stuff and I think a lot of people, for them, you know, some of the exhibits are new and that's really one of the things we're here for is you come in and you see something you know but then you learn about something you may not have seen before. What uh, does the future hold for the Cartoon Art Museum? Hopefully a lot more. I mean, we've been around for 29 years. We're hoping to be around for another 29. We've been doing some 
great exhibitions in the museum. It's just like every time we have to take an exhibition down, which we just had the 25th anniversary of The Sandman, Neil Gaiman's uh, quintessential work. And, you know, it was very sad to see that go. But then we have these awesome exhibits like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I'm like, yeah, okay, I missed The Sandman, but we've got Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles now. So there's always something different, and I think it's just a, a really wonderful thing to be able to show that diversity. So if someone wants to learn more about Cartoon Art Museum and their current exhibitions, where should they go? Uh, you can always find us on the web at cartoonart.org. And we also have a Facebook, a Twitter, and all the various other social media out there. So that's it from Cartoon Art Museum. I hope you enjoyed our tour as much as I did. If you're in San Francisco, make sure to stop by 655 Mission Street, right on Museum Row. I'm Daphne O'Neill with Fantastic Forum. Thanks for joining us. Ulysses Campbell for Fantastic Forum. We are here at SPX 2015, and I'm fortunate enough to be joined by two luminaries from Comixology.com. We have John D. Roberts, who is the co-founder, and we also have Chip Mosier, who is the VP of Marketing. Thank you very much for joining us, gentlemen. Glad to be here. Great to be here. Thanks, Ulysses. You guys have uh, supported uh, SPX. Uh, why do you think that's important? Why do you do it? Because they, there's great comics here. You know, there's a lot of great people making comics, a lot of amazing cartoonists, a lot of great stuff that we want to carry on the platform. So it's like, you know, part of our mission is to support the comics community. So being at SPX does that. And, you know, we strive to have the most diverse and deep catalog of comics available internationally, worldwide. And, uh, and that, <clears throat> that means having, you know, content from Marvel and DC to you know, mini comics from, uh, you know, felony comics upstairs, uh, Charles Chuck Forsman with Revenger, uh, Retrofit, Box Brown, so Spike Troutman. So uh, just having that kind of diversity is uh, just really important to have, you know, the best, best store, best uh, digital comics platform that we can. Well, and uh, that sort of leads me to where I was going with this, because I didn't have to be dragged kicking and screaming to digital comics, but um, I, I, for me, comics have always been a very tactile experience. So, but clearly, digital comics are here to stay, and you guys are the primary purveyor, the premier, well, I'm going to make something new up, the premier purveyor <laughs> of digital comics. And uh, we know that you guys are going to be around because you were acquired by Amazon, which, of course, knows what it's doing. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, I mean, Amazon, they were really impressed with us from the beginning and, you know, I mean, it took a while, but they, what they want to do and what we want to do is in line. So, you know, they publicly stated that they want to have every single book published digitally and, you know, we would love to have every single comic published digitally. So, a lot of the stuff that they want to do is stuff that we want to do, so it was a great fit and they've allowed us to do a lot of really cool things that we wouldn't have necessarily been able to do on our own and have a reach that we don't wouldn't necessarily be able to have and it allows us to w do things like, you know, sponsor the Ignatz Award and come to SPX and, and, you know, talk to and reach a lot of great creators. And cartoonists. Yeah, what's great is, you know, not only do we have uh, a sale on comicsology.com uh, uh, for uh, uh, content that's uh, here at SPX, it's available to anyone internationally, but also on amazon.com. So amazon.com slash digital comics, so you can go to the, the uh, digital comic storefront, and there's a SPX uh, uh, category there. Now, uh, just really quick, Chip, from a marketing standpoint, um, how has it been to convince a comics-loving audience that digital is the way to go? Uh, you know, it's it's you know, the, uh, of course, you have people that have been reading comics for years and years and years, and they don't want to change their habits, and that's fine. But you know, when you have instant access, immediate availability. 
you know, th those are compelling reasons. And, you know, we have a ton of people who are completely new to comics. And, you know, we've, uh, you know, we t we've talked very openly about this, that, uh, you know, there's a huge percentage of people that uh, are exposed to comics for the first time through Comixology, and then they go buy print. But, you know, I was talking to someone in the service who uh, ships out on an aircraft carrier, and, uh, and they, they told me, they were like, yeah, I thank God for you guys, because I can read my comics every Wednesday in the nine months that I'm deployed overseas instead of, like, waiting and getting caught up. And, you know, when you hear stuff like that, it's pretty gratifying. And then, then you got a lot of people who live in smaller and smaller apartments that just don't have the room for comics. I mean, part of the reason why Comixology exists in the first place is because I ran out of places to put my long boxes, you know. So a lot of people like the fact that, you know, they can fit their entire library on, a, on an iPad, you know, and that it takes up less space and that they constantly have their library with them and they don't have to, like, find it in a box. They can easily browse the app and, and get to what they want to read. You know, I think that there were a lot of people who were worried that this was going to put conventional comics out of business. And, you know, of course, as I've said many times, you know, yes, uh, your iPad isn't going to be worth a million dollars just because it's got a copy of Action Comics number one on it. You know, this isn't anything that's a threat to paper comics. It's something that's used in concert, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I mean, you know, we've noticed that while other industries have, you know, been affected more diver uh, dramatically by the introduction of digital print comics hasn't seen that happen. Uh, the comics industry has actually been growing over the last couple years. So both digital... Coinc coincidentally, yeah. it, really, it really started growing at the time that Comixology debuted digital comics. Yeah. I wonder why that is. I'm sure that's no coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you expose, you expose more people to comics, more people are going to buy comics. So, you know, whether it's print or digital. Yeah, we, had a lot of, uh, we had a lot of retailers tell us that people came into their stores looking for comics because they had discovered them in Comixology. So, you know, I mean, that's a, you know, introducing more people to comics, that's like one of our primary tenets, you know, it's like, how do we make as many people in the world a comic, a comics reader as possible? And that's how, where we feel Comixology comes into play. Well, and I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, one of the things that I have learned about Comixology is the portal that you have for people who actually want to make submissions where, you know, I mean now, you know, and I'm, I'm certainly not slamming print comics, but it's very difficult to get picked up by, you know, the, the distributor for print comics and get your comics available but you know you guys you know you're like hey wait a minute if you want to make a submission here we go talk a little bit about that please yeah so what you're talking about is our uh, comicsology submit platform it's a self-service platform where anyone can go and submit a comic it's all online you log in you agree to the contract it's a five-year non-exclusive we take no rights uh, you enter in all your metadata your publisher information you upload your PDF file there's a review process that we make sure that your PDF file looks as good as possible because you know we take the the responsibility of presenting your comics to the world very seriously so we want to make sure that we have the best version of the book possible. Uh, it goes up, it, it sits on, on our website next to other major publishers like Marvel and DC. We release new books every Wednesday and there's a direct URL that you can point people to do to go and buy your book. So if someone is following on Twitter that lives in Germany or in Japan, you can point them to your book and they can buy it instantly. Uh, and that's really powerful, that's a really powerful thing because you know we want people to see your comic. We want people to find it, to, to discover it. And digital, and the other thing about digital that's great is that it, you never run out. There's no, it's virtual inventory. So it's evergreen, you never run out. So you can, you know, even if you made that book 10 years ago, you can constantly send people to go and buy it right now. Accessibility, availability, ease of use. It, clearly, this is absolutely the wave of the future. Um, I, I appreciate, uh, John, Chip, you being on with us. Uh, I would love to talk to you more, but I know you all have some place to be, but this is... It, it, but it, hey, and it's a wonderful excuse for me to be able to ask you on again, because hopefully this introduction to Fantastic Forum will not be your sole experience with us. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Ulysses. Thank you. Ulysses Campbell for Fantastic Forum at SPX 2015. We'll be right back. I'm Cliff Chang, and you're watching Fantastic Forum. I'm uh, Abby Pritchard with Fantastic Forum, and I am here with Hugo and Nebula and World Fantasy Lifetime Achievement and Bram Stoker and basically every other possible award-winning author, George R. R. Martin. 
Uh, we're here at Cap Life, and he just did a really amazing reading with two new chapters, or at least partially new chapters, from the upcoming Winds of Winter. Um, and we have a couple questions. Uh, I know you're really involved with the SFWA program. Uh, is there a reason that's so personal and so great? Well, it's the Science Fiction Writers of America is an organization of uh, professional science fiction and fantasy writers. Uh, that helps each other. It's sort of the union of the field and, and uh, it also helps writers uh, in trouble with uh, medical expenses and uh, legal expenses as a medical legal defense fund and a medical emergency fund so we like to raise money for that. It's, it's writers helping other writers. You know, uh, I've been very, very fortunate in my career. Uh, my books have done very well and I've got a television show and all that but there's some brilliant writers who are not that fortunate and uh, you know, they have medical troubles as they get older and they really need help from the other writers and SFWA is uh, is great for that so that's why I've always been a big supporter of SFWA. Awesome, yeah. You uh, you hit your stride pretty early on. You've uh, won, I believe you won a Hugo back in the 70s. I, I did, yes, I was 1975 for Song for Laia, best novella. All right, well you've done novellas and short stories and you've done a lot of screenplay writing and of course You've done a few novels that may have <laughs> done okay. Uh, they, they haven't done too badly. Is there a reason that you switch up styles and genres? Do you have a favorite genre to write? And is there something that's particularly easy or difficult in one genre, um, but not others? No, I, I uh, you know, as a kid growing up, I read science fiction, fantasy, horror a lot. Uh, my father would lump it all together, call it weird stuff. And I sort of lump it all together, too. I, I, I don't think of these as distinct and separate genres. I think of them as variations of the same thing. Um, and it's all imaginative fiction, which uh, has always appealed to me more than uh, mimetic fiction uh, of contemporary life. Um, so I'm, I'm drawn to that. I'm drawn to these areas of the imagination, but I move from one to another freely. I don't want to write, do the same thing over and over again. Um, even, uh, I, of course, I've been working on A Song of Ice and Fire, the series that gave birth to Game of Thrones for a long, long time, but it's, uh, it's one big story. As long as it is, as many volumes as it is, it still has a beginning, a middle, and hopefully eventually an end, and when it's done, I'll, I'll move on to something completely different after that, I hope. Uh, are there things you can get away with in some mediums that you can't get away with in others? For example, is there something you like to do when you're screenwriting um, that you can't necessarily do when you're writing a novel or a short story? Well, every, every form has its own strengths and weaknesses. It, it has its own set of tools and you have to, uh, you know, you have to be aware of that. Uh, when you're writing for television, um, you know, you have the collaboration of so many talented people. You have people who design your backgrounds for you. You have actors who bring life to your words and special effects technicians who will do a wonderful job of creating your dragons or your direwolves or your fantastic backgrounds. Um, you also have the addition of things like a score. You know, you'd be amazed at how, how much uh, music, background music can add to a uh, a scene, be it a tense scene or a battle scene or, or whatever, just that, that music in the background, which sometimes you hardly even notice, really brings out the emotions. Um, and you have all that to draw upon. On the other hand, you also have limitations too. You have limitations of running time and budget. With books, you can do things. You have devices at your command that the, uh, that the visual arts don't have. You can do things like a, a strong point of view which is difficult to do in film you can have unreliable narrators since film is an objective medium it's hard to have a unreliable narrator because you're the viewer is seeing the things uh, firsthand um, pros can obscure as well as elucidate and you have the so you have tools that you don't have in film but on the other hand you also have to do everything yourself. You are the special effects technicians. You are the background painters and the scenery uh, people. You are the people who have to check for continuity. You don't have a whole team behind you. It's just you and the blank page. So I like both forms. That's why I've worked on both forms. Prose has always been my first love, though. It's where I started out. I was a voracious reader as a child. I'm a voracious reader still. And uh, I love television. I love film. But I love books most of all. Um, you're notorious, uh, or infamous, for sort of rejecting 
the way popular fantasy is written a lot of the time. You go for what you feel would realistically happen as opposed to, you know, this person must succeed because they're the good guy and that is what happens in fantasy literature. Um, but one of the things I really like that does seem sort of very pointed and intentional is the parallel journeys between Sansa and Arya. Um, and I was wondering if you had any favorite aspect of that, how, you know, how much it's planned out and how much it's just sort of happened that these characters have sort of fallen into this two sides of the same coin journey and whether we, you might give us a hint on whether they'll see each other again. Well, certainly I like to play with this, uh, you know, two sides of the same coin phenomenon. Uh, not only with the two Stark sisters, who of course are started from the same place, but as very different people. So as they go forward and have their different experiences, and we see how they react to them, their their uh, things that happen to them arise partly out of their circumstances, partly out of their own characters and the decisions they make. I do this with uh, other characters as as well too. Uh, you know the differing fates of Rob Stark and Jon Snow, the the brothers, one the bastard brother, the other the trueborn brother. Um, in, in the last two books, the differing ruling experiences of, of Cersei Lannister and Daenerys Targaryen, both of whom are trust into a position of great power, and how do they handle that power, and what do they do with that power. That, that kind of thing is fun to examine. As to how much is planned ahead of time, uh, well, I don't know, some of it, uh, but maybe not as much as you might think. I, I know in broad strokes where the story is going. I know my ultimate destination and the ultimate fate of most of these characters, but a lot of it is the, the journey along the way. is a lot of the fun for me as a writer as well as for the reader. The devil is in the details, as they say, so I put my characters in motion and then we see who they meet and, and where, their, where their story takes them. All right. Um, speaking of Cersei, uh, we know that Tyrion is capable of being a very, you know, a very good leader, and Jamie's shown a lot more signs of it since its journey with Brienne. Do you think that Cersei could have had that kind of leadership capability if she wasn't so paranoid in regards to protecting her family and obsessed with the, uh, the prophecy that is completely clouding her judgment and to a certain extent her sanity? Well, the prophecy is certainly one factor. Her, her own individual character, I think, is is one factor in one sense. I mean, Cersei is an interesting case, uh, and it's a sort of a commentary on the society that she lives in. I, you know, in one sense, she's extremely privileged. She's the daughter of uh, one of the greatest houses in the realm. She's beautiful. She's She's rich, she's uh, in, entitled, um, she's shown deference by most people that she meets, so you, you have a situation of extreme privilege that produces, I think, a certain attitude in people. On the other side, though, she's also a woman in an extremely patriarchal society where, you know, on one hand she's being told that she's better than everybody and she has all these things and the other people no you can't do that no that's not for you no your brother gets that you don't get that so uh, you know that the conflict that that creates in people I think is something that's fun to explore and I've certainly tried to explore it with Cersei but they you know the other thing to keep in mind though is Cersei's not journey is not over yet so I'm only five books into it and there's two more books to write so uh, keep keep reading all right do you think her relationship with Tyrion would be better um, if her mother, if their mother had survived? Or do you think there's just sort of too many elements of personality clash there for that to have made as much of a difference as she credits it with? I don't know. I'm, I'm writing a story as it happened. Uh, what if stories? I'll, I'll leave to the readers to figure out. All right. Uh, in Faith of the Seven, aside from the father and the mother and the stranger, the male uh, gods are very much what they do, the smith and the warrior, whereas the female ones are what they are. Does that, you know, the crone and the maiden, does that tie into with the way the society is set up in what you just talked about with Cersei and the role of women versus the role of men? Does it dictate the way the faith uh, observes morality in terms of gender and sexual dynamics? Yeah, I hadn't really thought about that in that way. Of course, I stole the maiden mother crone uh, 
a triad from uh, many established yeah. pagan religions. It's uh, it's hardly original with me. I created the male parallel to uh, you know go along with that, and then added the the stranger to have the seven sided god as sort of a, a variant on the Christian uh, trinity of uh, three gods in one. And instead, we have seven gods in one, but there's really just one god, etc. So. Uh, no, well, there's other, you know, parallels in that regard, Hephaestus and Ares, for example. Um, you have two on-page uh, lesbian sex scenes, but they're both with canonically straight female characters, whereas most of your gay characters are implied. Uh, might that change? Is there a reason you chose to do that? You know, I'm, I'm, I use a very tight third-person viewpoint, so... Uh, which is one another way that things differ between the television show and the, and the books because uh, the you know you my books are told through the viewpoints of a handful of characters in a cast of hundreds uh, thousands perhaps there's like a dozen who were actually inside their head we're seeing through their eyes so the only things we see firsthand are the things that they're present for while when the television show can present something like uh, the scene in Blackwater between Bronn and the Hound, which uh, you know may have occurred in the books, but neither Bronn nor the Hound is a is a character, so is a viewpoint character. So we would not have seen that, except I mean we could have heard about it through dialogue. Bronn could have come back and said, "Well, this happened," you know. But uh, so that creates a stricture on what you can show and what you can't show. Um, there are certainly plenty of rumors that are going on about. Uh, sex between various characters. Are they true? Are they not true? Um, un until they actually happen to one of my characters on stage, uh, to one of the viewpoint characters, it's going to remain the present structure. And uh, as to whether it will change in future books, yeah, anything's possible in future books. I, that's, I have 3,000 more pages to write here, so. Are there any point of view, or is there any character you wish you could have, you could give a point of view to, but who knows too much, or who simply isn't in the right place to have a relevant impact? Well, I don't, I don't wish to give them a point of view, but yes, there are characters who know too much, and that's why they don't have a point of view. Uh, some of the master players, like Varys and Littlefinger, are simply uh, too much in the, really? in the thick of things here. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for my talking pleasure. to me. My pleasure. Ulysses Campbell for the Comic Science Fiction and Fantasy Fans Fantastic Forum. I'm here in the shadow of the Capitol with my friends from the 501st Legion in support of the effort to bring a science fiction museum to our nation's capital. If you'd like more information on how you can support this effort, contact the web address that you see on screen. Hopefully, the force will be with us in this effort. Uh, no offense, fellas. Join the Fantastic Forum fan community on Facebook and follow us on Twitter for all the latest news and updates.